Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Amos. How many have read the book of Amos? Wow, that's pretty awesome. We didn't have so many at the first service. <laughs> well, we're going to share with you from the seventh chapter of Amos, beginning with verse 1. Now, this book of Amos today is telling the people that he is not a paid consultant and he's not a part of the union. Amos goes to the north and he warns the bad things are coming. Amos shares visions of Israel's coming doom as well as prophesies their restoration. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord God was forming locusts at the time the late grass began to sprout. It was the late grass following the king's harvest. When they had finished eating the plants on the land, I said, Lord God, please forgive. How can Jacob survive? He is so small. And so the Lord relented and said, it won't take place. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord God was calling for judgment with fire and it devoured the deep and ate up part of the land. Then I said, Lord God, I beg you, stop. How can Jacob survive? He is so small. The Lord God relented concerning this also. This, this also won't take place, says the Lord. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing at a wall with a plumb line in his hand. The Lord God said to Amos, what do you see? A plumb line, I said. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the middle of my people Israel. I will never forgive them again. The shrines of Isaac will be made desolate and the holy places of Israel will be laid waste and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with a sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, reported to the Israel's king Jeroboam saying, you need to know that Amos plotted against you within the house of Israel. The land can't cope with everything he's saying. Amos then said, Jeroboam will die by the sword and Israel will be forced out of the land. Amaziah said to Amos, you see things, go. Run away to the land of Judah. Eat your bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's holy place and his royal palace. Amos answered Amaziah saying, I am not a prophet, nor am I a prophet's son but I am a shepherd and a trimmer of sycamore trees. But the Lord took me from shepherding the flock and the Lord told me, go prophesy to my people Israel. Now you hear the Lord's word. You say don't prophesy against Israel and don't preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore the Lord proclaims, your wife will become a prostitute in the city and your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be measured and divided up you yourself will die in an unclean land and Israel will surely be taken away from its land. This is the word of God for all of us here today. So had any of you heard of Amos before today's Bible reading? A couple of you? Well, he's a prophet in the Bible who we don't talk about a whole lot. So if you haven't heard of him before, that's okay. That's what we're here to learn about, right? Does anybody know what a prophet is? What's a prophet? Okay. What were you going to say, Will? I was going to say a messenger of God's word. Yes, it's a messenger of God's word. And they mentioned a plumb line in the, the verse. Have you guys ever seen a plumb line before? Well, this is a representation of what a plumb line looks like. It's probably a lot bigger, but it's a big long line that has a big heavy thing on the end of it, just like this. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> All right. So I know some of you up here have lots of activities you like to do. I know we have some artists up here that like to draw, and we have some athletes because we have some baseball and football players and swimmers. What other activities do you guys like to do? I do soccer. soccer. Gymnastics. Gymnastics. Um, Swim at a pool, play. Lizzie? Reading. Reading. Volleyball. Volleyball. What do you have, Will? Solving Rubik's Cubes for a living. <laughs> all right. So those are all excellent activities, and we like to do those because those are gifts that God gave us, right? And he wa is happy when he sees us using those gifts and working to improve on those gifts. But do you think those gifts could ever become a bad thing? No? Well, what about if you spend so much time on those gifts and working on improving those gifts that you let it interfere with forming your relationships with your friends, your family, even God himself? Do you think it might become a bad thing then? Yes. Yeah, so he wants to see us improve, but he also wants us to take time to work on forming those relationships, especially with him. Do you know how you might form relationships with God? What do you think? Do you have an answer? You forgot? Go ahead. Praying? Will? Elena? Writing it down? Yeah? Reading the Bible. Sometimes it can just be as simple as taking time to be still and to listen and watch the things around you, because that's a way that God can communicate with you as well. And, you know, it's very important because if Amos had been busy doing whatever shepherds did back at that time, whether it be learning to sing or watching the stars at night, whatever it is, if he was so busy that he didn't have that relationship with God, he may not have heard God and been able to pass those stories on to us for us to learn from, right? And we want to make sure we're listening to God because Amos was just a normal, everyday shepherd, just like we're normal, everyday people. So you never know when God may want to be communicating with us for important things to share as well. So do you think you guys can, can work on forming those relationships as well as working on those activities? Yeah. All right. You guys want to join me in a quick prayer? Yeah. All right. Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for the Bible and the stories we can learn from. Thank you for the amazing talents that you've allowed us to have. Please help us to continue to remember, to work on our relationships with our friends, family, and especially yourself. In Jesus' name, In Jesus name. amen. <laughs>
The book of Amos is a book in the Bible that um, should not be taken lightly. Its lessons are as a, are relevant as your next breath. Here is a man that, from a small town that's six miles south of Bethlehem and 11 miles from Jerusalem. Almost everything about him is ordinary until God takes over and then some unusual events take place. The story of Amos is a story really of every man and woman and child when God comes into the picture. Amos, as we read this morning, is from a small town in Judah called Tekoa. He earned his living taking care of sheep and, and the sycamore grove. Because of his skills with words and his strikingly broad range of his general knowledge of history and the world, we realize that he was not an ignorant person. He wasn't just an ignorant peasant. Even though he made his home in the southern kingdom, God called Amos to announce his judgment to the northern kingdom of Israel. By his own witness, which he made in defending his right to be prophet to an angry Amaziah, he was neither paid, he was neither made a prophet, nor was he a prophet's son. He was simply a shepherd and a man who cultivated sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took him from tending the flocks, and Amos said, he called me to go and to prophesy to my people. A more unlikely prophet could scarcely be found. He went from the farm where he talked with the animals and, and dressed the trees to proclaim to the nation, including its king, that they needed to mend their ways. His calls and credentials were not from any connection with any professional prophets, but from God alone. God still chooses to call some very unlikely people into service now, today. I personally am far from being a, a shining star as a preacher, but the fact that I do it is unusual to say the least. I was called into ministry when I was a teenager. I had never heard a woman preacher when I answered God's call. I came from a middle-class family. We were a little bit farmers. My dad both worked. We didn't have a lot, but we had enough. And I was a little bit introverted back then. And you know, as a teenager, you're pretty insecure, especially when you tell your friends you're going to go into ministry. The fact that I'm still in the ministry less than 100 years later is something of a miracle in itself. But how about you? Did you ever once think that you would one day sing in the choir? or that you would teach a Sunday school class? Did you ever think that you would lead a women's or a men's group or sit on a church board and, and be a part of the decision-making group for the whole church? Did you ever dream before you came to Christ that you would be one who fearlessly witnessed for God and try to live your life as he directed? You are an unlikely candidate as well, huh? 
But one day while you were tending the sheep or trimming the sycamore tree or selling insurance or managing a company, maybe you were digging a ditch or you were building a house or performing heart surgery or pleading a court case or whatever. God called you, and however unlikely it seemed, the glad result is that here you are doing exactly what God called you to do. Unusual to say the least, isn't it? The truth is that fundamental qualities for ministry are within reach of every person here. It's not required that one be a person of unusual intellectual ability. What is demanded is virtue that is sweetened by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The spiritualization of our average capacities is more important than the possessions of unusual power. The spiritualization of our average capacities is the most important. Our ordinary abilities, when touched by the Spirit of God, become extraordinary. <clears throat> There's no guarantee that when God takes you in hand for his purpose that everything will automatically go smoothly and well. Amos saw that both Judah and Israel were enjoying great prosperity. They had reached the height of political power and military might. But you know what? Both kingdoms were corrupt of the core. Idolatry was rampant. There was extravagant indulgence in luxurious living and immorality and corruption and terrible oppression of the poor. Amos came on the scene sounding out God's displeasure at the utterly rotten social state of the nation. And then he issued a clarion call to repent and practice justice. Well, at first those people liked Amos a lot. He began preaching against rival nations. He lashed out at their deeds and, and dispelled their doom. He spelled it out. It was sort of like today when the preacher berates murders in the streets or condemns communists and, and castigates thieves and rebukes the practice of incest and, and the horrible things that drug dealers do. You can get a lot of affirmation when you preach that way, when you let the other really bad guys have it. So at first there was total agreement with Amos, for they were delighted when the promise of wrath was falling on somebody worse than they were. Then, just when he had made his hearers lulled into sweet, self-righteous satisfaction, Amos came to the punchline of his sermon and he denounced them for social injustice. There was a, a cartoon I saw recently about a couple that was leaving after church. You know, we meet you out here at the doors. And, and the, the man said to the, the pastor, um, I really liked your sermon today. but I didn't like the part that made me feel bad. There was once a, 
a timid minister who had often straddled the fence and he was told by one of the members of the congregation to preach an old-fashioned gospel and when instructed by another to be broad-minded. Everybody has an idea of how the, the pastor should preach, you know. The result of his struggle was evident the next time he preached and he said, unless you repent in a measure and are converted, so to speak, you are, I'm sorry to say, in danger of hell, fire, and damnation to a certain extent. <laughs> but Amos was no fence straddler. He came speaking a thus saith the Lord and was soon out of favor with his hearers. And they decided he had to go he had to go. Am Amaziah invited him to leave, go back to Judah and tell your message to them. Preaching of God's displeasure with our sins and his impending judgments upon our lives of disobedience is no more popular today than it was a long time ago. If Amos's oracles are to mean anything to us, we must realize that it is just a single giant step from the 8th century prophet of the Old Testament to today. The lessons are the same. God still governs nations and individuals and ultimately no national sin, no personal sin goes unnoticed or unpunished. This kind of preaching got Amos into trouble. And you know what? It got Jesus into trouble too. Jesus was not crucified for saying, in my father's house there are many mansions. Or consider the lilies of the field or, lo, I am with you always. He wasn't crucified for saying, love one another. They did not nail Jesus to a cross because he went about doing good. He was nailed to the tree because two nations, one great and one small, Rome and Israel, were absolutely scandalized by his vision of kingdom different than anything that any of them had ever dreamed. When Jesus came to his first sermon in Nazareth, they liked the message for a while. They might even have been proud of their local hometown boy making good. How pleased they were to hear that he'd come to recover the sight to the blind and to deliver the captives and to release the oppressed. But Isaac, as he continued... They got so upset with him that they wanted to run him out of town. They wanted God to bring down wrath on other nations, not theirs. They were mad at the preacher and even tried to throw him off a cliff. Of course, we don't treat preachers that way today, do we? Would you throw me off a cliff? No. Thank you. <laughs> but I tell you what people might do, Will. If they don't like what I say, they might stop coming to church. Or they might ignore the sermon altogether. And even worse, they might quit paying their tithes and offerings. And tell the folks at the Sunday dinner table that the preacher is sure not as good as the last one was. Preachers are not only the witnesses of Christ who can be unpopular and in disfavor with others, folks. Many of the fine laity could tell of experiences where friends didn't mind their talking about the joy and the peace and the love of Jesus. They'd like them to stay away from the conversations about 
deals with God's severe displeasure of our specific sins. How many Christians have found themselves out of favor with a boss because they refuse to lie or refuse to compromise their principles on the poor ethics of a business deal? I was fired for doing that once. Many have found that they are not considered really in because they do not tolerate filthy innuendos or refuse to laugh at racist remarks. There was a church I was serving once and I was talking to a gentleman and I said, you know, you're glad to have me to be your pastor. You call me to bury your dead and you want me to baptize your babies. You ask me to counsel your wife and, and family when there's problems but you never invite me to your parties. Why is that? And his quiet response was, oh, preacher, you really wouldn't want to come. I don't want to invite you for two reasons. One, you wouldn't approve of what goes on, and, and two, your presence would be a real wet blanket to the activities that we have planned. Unpopular is what the Christian becomes in a world that is given up to lust and deceit and decadence. God's imminent judgment on Israel for her sin was not to be a mere slap on the wrist to warn them, as he often had before, but it was the ominous word of an almost total destruction of the na nation the unthinkable was about to come to pass. God would uproot his people for their sins and lack of repentance, and he would do it by the hands of the pagan nation. But still, even so, unbelievable as it seems, if they would repent, God would still have mercy on the remnant. He would not wipe out a nation completely. It's almost like God had a love affair with his people, and, and when they deserted him and were unfaithful and disobedient, he found it hard to let them go. There's a story about the great magician, Harry Houdini, had a lifelong love affair with his wife, and he always was writing her little notes, and they always began, Dear Bess, You'll never know how much I love you. And Beth said that long after his death, she was still finding those little notes in the attic or in the office or in the pockets of things. How like God. How like God. He cannot forsake his people if there's even a glimmer of a chance of them returning to him. They and we have been warned over and over again and again have been asked to repent. No matter what kind of punishment was sent to them, those people would deserve it. They had sinned beyond all the limits of divine compassion. But unbelievably, his great promise came in If you repent, I'll restore the kingdom. I'll restore the house of David, and David will rule once more over Israel, and you will feast and wine and, and eat fruit in the promised land. There's always more mercy in God than there is in sin itself. And there was a, well, there was a little boy um, that liked to play soccer. And he was really good. 
and he was playing a match one day, and all the game was almost halfway finished, he had kicked four of the team's five goals. The other team had not scored at all, and when the game was almost over, the boy moved his way up to the mouth of the goal, and another certain goal was expected, but to the amazement of everyone there, he just gave that bull a little weak tap. and he didn't score. And when the game was over, the dad said to the little boy, what, what were you thinking? Why did you do that? Why didn't you make the goal? And the little boy said, Dad, the goalie was crying. God's great heart always goes out to his wayward children and our tears of repentance move him to promise us forgiveness and restoration. God warns and entreats, and sure doom is foretold, and judgment will fall, but if we repent, he will restore. Such a wondrous promise ought to make us to fall deeply in love with the one who cares so much for us. There was a remarkable lady named Minnie Pierce. She had the lead in her senior play during her college days. And she'd worked really, really hard on her part. And after their performance, she was startled when a man came up to her backstage and introduced himself as the writer of that play. And he said to, to many, he said, I just wanted to come back and tell you that I have seen this drama many times, but tonight you embodied what I'd envisioned for the heroine better than anyone else has ever done. Tonight, you made a dream of mine come true. You gave my, my play flesh and blood, and I want to thank you. We can only ask ourselves the question, wouldn't it be wonderful to get to the end of the drama of this life? and there to meet the divine author and have him say, you made the dream I had for you come true. What I had in mind when I created you is exactly what you did with your life day and night. We all still have a chance to get it right, folks to repent, to obey, and to claim the promise of God. And I think that's an unbelievable promise. Let us pray. Dear God, I thank you for Amos, the book of Amos, which tells us a story that is so parallel to life today and it's paralleled in varieties of ways. One, countries that argue and fight and think they're the best over somebody else, all that stuff. But most of all, the fact that you chose Amos, a shepherd out in the fields, and in our time it could be a, a lawyer in a law office or a doctor or a nurse or the head of a company You've called even children to be prophets. Help us, O oh God, to when, you, when we realize that you have called each of us to be a prophet in our time, to bring about peace, to speak about our Lord Jesus Christ, even if it does irritate someone, it might possibly bring them to you. 
help us to be willing to be your prophets without any fancy degrees, just hearts to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, Amos. I'm glad you were here today. I hope that you take up the challenge that God has called you to, to be prophets in the world, to show the world a good way to live when you have the joy and the peace and the love of Christ in your heart. May that be the words this week as you prophesy to others. Go with peace, go with grace, and go with God's love. Amen.